All right, so thank you so much again, all for showing up for Freedom All's fifth political education workshop on anti-Blackness and border regime. My name is Fatima. I'm a member of FTA's political education committee together with my compass, Alexis, Evan, Jess, and Leslie. And what I'll do is give you a brief overview of who we are and how this workshop is going to play out. And then I'll turn over to Anne-Marie from our action committee who will introduce our amazing panelists. So if you're new to Free Them All, we're a coalition of organizers and activists based in the San Diego, Tijuana region on occupied Kumaya land who are committed to affirming migration as a human right. We are working towards a world without cages, border walls, armed enforcers and institutions built on white supremacy. Our work starts with closing the Otay Mesa Detention Center and freeing them all. These are our values. We believe in the freedom of movement and that migration is a human right. We stand in solidarity with all migrants, refugees, and those seeking asylum without condition. We fight for abolition. We support the decolonization of all occupied lands. We strive to build a democratic movement that is multiracial, multi-ethnic, gender inclusive, disability inclusive, and welcoming of all faith. And we center the liberation of the oppressed in all aspects of our organizing. If you're interested in joining our work, leave your email address in the chat or contact us on Instagram. We have um, bi-weekly general meetings and various committees, one of which is the Political Education Committee, which organizes these workshops around our larger topic every last Wednesday of the month. Um, and if you wanna see our earlier events, check out our YouTube channel. We post a link in the chat. And um, with that, um, I'll come to a brief overview of tonight. We'll start out with the presentations by our three panelists. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. We'll then move on to breakout groups, where we'll continue the discussion in smaller groups for around 20, 25 minutes. Um, and I'll say more about that after the panel discussion, and then we'll end with another plenary session. All right, so um, with that, I'll turn over to Anne-Marie, who will introduce our panelists. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Anne-Marie. And I am part of Freedom All San Diego. And I am also part of a loose coalition called Alliance in Defense of Black Immigrants that was formed in response to a massive effort to stop mass deportations to Cameroon in October and then November. Our two main objectives at the time were to stop deportations of Black immigrants, specifically at the time, focusing on Cameroon, and also to, in the, in, in the recognition of our failure to stop deportations, to keep an eye on those who were deported. And this has been very important because by keeping our focus on what is happening within the borders of this country and also in Cameroon or other nations where people have been deported, allow us to really focus in on the necessity of understanding the interconnectedness of the struggles and relations of anti-Blackness. And it is within that context that our amazing panelists today were asked to talk about manifestations of and struggles against anti-Blackness within their own work 
as it may relate to racial, colonialism, ca capitalist systems, the carceral state, the migration, the control and containment of Black populations, and struggles for liberation more broadly. Of course, this is a big task for the 15 minutes they have each been given, but it is an important conversation to begin. And so our panelists today are Guerlain Joseph, who is a founder and director of Haitian Bridge Alliance, which is based in San Diego, California. We will also hear from Sadi Sar, founder and director of African Bureau of Immigration and Social Affairs, based in Detroit, Michigan, and Mohamed Abumaye from Critical Refugee Studies Collective. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the California State University in San Marcos. I want to thank you all, the panelists, for taking the time to be with us this evening. We are very much looking forward to this very stimulating and engaging discussion. We begin this evening by hearing from Mohamed Ahumaye, and I will briefly provide an overview of his work, which centers on the intersections between military and police violence. He investigates the San Diego Police Department's unit of counterterrorism and US military drone attacks in Somalia as a transnational circuit of violence that shapes the Pali refugee flight. What distinguishes his project from other works on police is that he focuses on the militarized aspects of policing and does so with an emphasis on the refugee. He centers the role of Somali youth activists in exposing the relationship between US militarism in Somalia and hyper-policing in City Heights, a neighborhood of San Diego. Mohammed's work interrogates City Heights as a translocal space by interweaving the field of Black studies, critical refugee studies, and carceral studies. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for the <clears throat> lovely introduction. I'll uh, keep this brief. Um, you know, a lot of my work deals with uh, not just the issues of immigration, but also more per, uh, specifically the relationship between anti-Blackness and Islamophobia, looking at really the Somali refugee community in San Diego as, as a case and a site. And I really can't talk about, you know, the work that I've been doing without referencing the Black Freedom Summer that happened in the summer of 2020 in terms of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the protests, which had a profound impact on the Somali refugee community. Um, I was actually uh, able to attend some of the protests in City Heights, uh, uh, some of the car caravans. And it was really through this, uh, being a part of these protests that I saw, you know, at the forefront of these protests is organizing young Somalis, young Somali refugees, high school students, right? Um, really being politicized in this particular moment. Um, and really mobilizing a politics that centers on police abolition. Uh, and uh, as a result of you know, being a part of these protests and meeting these young Somali activists, um, me along with um, another uh, academic activist, Jesse Mills, we formed uh, this, uh, what is called the Critical Somali Studies Collective, which was an organization and we're still, we still have regular meetings of activists, scholars, students throughout the Somali diaspora in the United States um, that are really organizing around the issues of police violence, uh, mass incarceration, uh, and immigrant detention as it relates to Somali refugees uh, in San Diego, right? And, you know, I think for the Somali community, um, as we think about these issues of anti-Blackness at the intersection of anti-immigrant rhetoric, and the US-Mexico border, right? Um, I also really think about Islamophobia and the war on terror. And, you know, 
it's really on my mind that um, we met with uh, a critical member of our collective, Salma uh, Ibrahim, who's based in Minneapolis. And she really told this story um, of when she was 11 uh, in the Somali community in Minneapolis, having Somalis who were paid FBI informants, uh, whose project was to surveil the Somali community, right? And in the story, you know, um, she was 11 and when she, ever she went, he owned a convenience store, he would ask her, what are your parents, you know, politics? What, how do your parents view America? You know, what um, are your parents' political affiliation? How do you feel about 9-11, right? And really trying to use, you know, these children as a way to get at their parents, right? And, and I, you know, I tell this story and the story that she told, right, as a way to sort of highlight, uh, right, the extreme levels of surveillance that Somali refugee community has been in this country since 9-11, right? And again, she tells another story of being 17 um, and being approached by an FBI agent saying, hey, you know, we can help you with your schooling. We can offer you money. You can make good money. You know, we want to help you. You know, we want to help the Somali uh, refugee community, right? That's our job. And um, I, I think... Open the bag. See what we got. Sorry, been muted. Um, you know, I, I think thinking of that story and thinking about that particular story of surveillance really um, underpins, you know, for the community and for the activists, the level, the tremendous levels of state intervention into Somali life, right? That in one precedes Somali's uh, arrival even to the United States, right? And that to think of the issue of black immigration and what it means to be a black immigrant right, and refugee, one has to think about the context of what was happening in Africa at that time, right? Um, a, a, a lar the largest number of African immigrants to the United States came in the mid 1990s, early 1990s, right? And the reason for that is multifaceted, but mostly civil wars and unrest that was happening in Africa. And in Somalia in particular, that was a result of US imperialism. That was a result of you know, the US military came to us before we came here, right? The 1993 US military invasion of Somalia, right? Um, and again, this history of using paid informants to surveil, infiltrate the Somali community, right? Goes as far back as the Cold War, right? The US military using informants uh, to destabilize Somali politics, the Somali government, and Somali resist resistance. So all of that really came together in the summer of 2020 when I saw these young Somali activists that, that we work with and that we mentor and that we learn from as part of our Critical Somali Studies Collective is that they, they have been simultaneously organizing around the issues of Somalis who are deported for being suspected of providing material aid to terrorism, which basically means if you send any money back home to Somalia, the FBI, right, and the and and the U.S. military, as well as you know the Department of Homeland Defense, can say you are supporting terrorism and deport you, right? Uh, as well as right, the heightened levels of police surveillance that the Somali community is undergoing in City Heights, San Diego, where a, a large number of of the Somali community lives in, right? So you have sort of this police surveillance that is happening you have the surveillance that is happening through the war on terror and the joint terrorism task force in San Diego, right? And you also have Somalis living at the intersection of a militarized border, the US-Mexico border, where there is already very heightened anti-immigrant sentiments and policies. And so for these youth activists that I work with, the ways in which they see anti-blackness, for them anti-blackness is deeply intertwined with Islamophobia and anti-immigrant sentiments, right? And that for these activists that they are organizing uh, not just a local resistance movement through the Black Lives Matter movement, but really a global movement to argue that the devaluation and violence against black people and the black diaspora is a global phenomenon, right? That doesn't just manifest in police murders of black people in the United States, but US military drone strikes in Somalia right, that manifest through immigrant detention uh, uh, in terms of uh, black immigrants, police violence against black people in Brazil, right, uh, being a sig significant marker of 
right, how we think about the Black diaspora. But what is really fascinating in terms of the work that I do with these activists is that their resistance and how they organize is multifaceted and transnational, right? And so as part of these organization, many of these youth activists in San Diego are linked with uh, Somali youth activists in Somalia that are organizing around the issues of US military bases and sort of the, the US military drone strikes that have actually accelerated under you know, Obama and Trump and is really a, a, a significant threat to Somali life. And so what has emerged is this transnational uh, black resistance movement that is still centered on sort of local politics, right? Understanding uh, uh, the San Diego community um, as well. And so, you know, in terms of uh, the work that I do with them in my own work, I think, you know, engaging, we meet every Wednesday um, and it's part political education that we have and it's part uh, workshops, right? So we had a workshop that really looked at um, intergenerational trauma, but also uh, that looked at inter intergenerational resistance, right? And many talking to Selma, you know, she talked about how her grandfather, right? Prior to her as one of the youth activists, was really central in uh, resistance to Italian colonialism in Somalia, right? Uh, uh, Somalia was a former uh, uh, Italian colony and how her grandfather's resistance and politics really inspired and motivated sort of the, the kind of work she does today around, uh, she's a, a pretty uh, major leader in the Black Lives Matter movement in Minneapolis, uh, uh, Minnesota, right? And so I think seeing this not only historical connection to a long history of resistance to state violence, right, that, that is central to the Somali community, but also sort of the ways in which that this history continues, right, and these youth are not just being politicized in a vacuum, right, but, but actually drawing from their family and also drawing from, you know, uh, living in San Diego, living in City Heights and living in a very interracial community, right, where they're side by side with other refugee communities, you know, from El Salvador, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, and you know, seeing how the commonalities and sort of their shared uh, oppression under state surveillance and U.S. imperialism, but also the differences, right? And 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 how to mobilize and organize together across those differences and shared experiences as well. So I think it was a really exciting moment where I think at 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 one point one could see tremendous apathy in the constant circulation of black death with George Floyd that we've seen, but also tremendous hope uh, in the sense of, you know, this black resistance movement where the protests that we saw, right, and talking to the activists weren't just taking place in the United States, but you know, you had protests for George Floyd happening in France and the UK and all over the world, right? And I think that's a really exciting uh, possibility for how we can, you know, really organize and, and think of, Think of resistance uh, in this particular in, in this particular moment, and I think one thing that um, one of the protests that I, I went to that was organized by a local Black Lives Matter chapter in San Diego that was really exciting in this moment was um, we were part of a car caravan. We were, we were visiting sites in which you know Black life has been under assault or devalued, right? So going to uh, uh, the det immigrant detention center, you know, going to city heights, going to spaces where black folks have been assaulted by the police. But also one of the sites that we went to was uh, a site that represented uh, a, a murder of a, a, a by, of a Somali woman, right? Um, who was murdered by her, uh, her husband, right? And sort of arguing that this particular, you know, gendered form of violence is also central to sort of how we think about Black Lives Matter and how we think about violence uh, uh, against black bodies and resistance to it as well. And so, you know, this kind of work that I've been doing with these activists, you know, we plan to um, uh, create a series of oral history projects and workshops. Uh, we're launching a website um, uh, for, for our organization. And we're also uh, creating platforms for these youth to sort of connect with each other across the, the, the Somali diaspora, both in Minneapolis, where there was the, uh, uh, pretty recent murder of a Somali man, Dalal Id, by the Minneapolis Police Department. And I think it is very important to not just talk about San Diego for the Somali community, but talk about Minneapolis being the center of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, last summer, right? But also Minneapolis being the largest 
uh, having the largest Somali refugee community in the United States and having significant Somali uh, organizers uh, uh, such as Misty Noor in the Black Lives Matter movement and really thinking of Black immigrants not just as passive recipients or victims of state violence and immigrant detention, but as actually active political agents for social change, right? Uh, that for many historically can go as far back as, as Marcus Garvey. And so to kind of finish off you know, my talk, um, um, if any of y'all are interested, I'm currently finishing up uh, my book manuscript that, I, that I'm working on with UC Press that should be coming out uh, um, this fall uh, entitled The Black Muslim Refugee, Militarism Policing and Somali Refugee Resistance to State Violence, right? That really kind of looks at you know, this long history of resistance, but, but arguing that by, by you know, taking a Somali refugee epistemology, forms of knowing that the Somali community provides a way for us to see in the world to learn of not ways of resisting that are everyday forms of resistance, but also seeing how the state and state apparatuses are increasingly interconnected and interlinked, such as, you know, the Department of Homeland Defense, the FBI, the military, the ways in which uh, that we must not only abolish the police for Black life to be free in this way, right, or life in general, but also uh, a politics that is centered on military abolition, the abolition of the military, that so long as these twin apparatuses exist, that Black life will continue to be uh, under threat. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen. Thank you so much. Mohammed, that was incredibly important, powerful, and insightful, and really addresses exactly what we are trying to accomplish in this session. And there is so much I would like to engage with you right now, <laughs> but uh, we're going to have time for that. So to all the participants who are here, Please keep in mind your questions, you can put them in the chat, but we will also have an opportunity to break out and have smaller discussion and then reconvene. I will now turn to our second speaker, who I have had the honor and pleasure of working with very closely in the last several months. And this is Galen Joseph who is the founder and executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, which assists thousands of Haitians and other migrants who have endured treacherous journeys from their home country to across South Africa, uh, sorry, <laughs> South America, <laughs> to make it to the US-Mexico border. And the mission for Haitian Bridge Alliance is to guide, elevate, and empower Haitian and other Black immigrants from Caribbean and other African countries through advocacy, organizing, outreach, and direct services. Lynn has produced or created an information tool called Tales from the U.S.-Mexico US Borderlands and Beyond which focuses on Black immigrants at the borderlands. And this has been extremely important in terms of challenging this pervasive erasure of Black immigration and immigration being a Black issue. So with that, there's much more that can be said about Galeen's work but I would like to hear her speak instead. So I will turn it to you, Kelly. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Professor Abmaye. Thank you for uh, uplifting the voice of our Somalis, brothers and sisters, so, so needed. Too often, right, as Anne-Marie mentioned, we are erased, silenced, and, and, and not being able to really uh, be present even when we lead the movement. So thank you so much for sharing uh, the plight of the Somali community. Um, thank you again for having me, uh, Gerlin Joseph Haitian with Alliance. Uh, it is such an honor to be in your presence. And anytime I have to speak, 
and Sadie is there, I feel like, why do I even have to say a word? Because she is there. She's going to speak. Um, Sadie is my sister, my partner, my 2 a.m. call. Um, and together we have uh, a launch and created the Black Immigrants Bell Fund, Juneteenth of last year, specifically to be able to answer to the needs of Black immigrants who find themselves caged imprisoned uh, in this United States of ours, given $50,000 plus bond. So she and I uh, just got tired and we created the Black Immigrants Bell Fund. And also um, a, a one of a part of the, in defense of Black immigrants, uh, uh, as Anne-Marie mentioned, that is a group that came together uh, to, to, to support our Cameroonian brothers and sisters who were in dire needs uh, last year. So it, it is an honor uh, to be here with so many people who have been in the fight with us and for us for a very long time. Um, I can just quickly share for, for folks who are new to what's happening at the border, especially because, you know, we are um, headquartered in, in, in uh, San Diego, understanding the relationship of the border cities, San Diego and Tijuana, right? Understanding that Tijuana uh, is one of the main port of entries for asylum seekers into the United States. And now when we hear about the crisis at the border and we see all of those videos and we see uh, uh, Ted Cruz uh, whispering because he's having this, 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 you know, this montage as if something just happened at the border. The reality is black migrants have been at the border since 2015. And I will repeat that. Black migrants have been at the border since 2015. And we saw how things progressed when it was only black migrants to when having the idea that we have this massive invasion at the border, right? And we see it on the news. And uh, in, 20, in 2018, President Trump tweeted, and everybody started screaming, family separation. How can we allow this to happen? But what people do not understand is that family separation have been happening at the border since 2016. Because when we see black migrants come and ask for asylum, and in very rare, very rare uh, 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 um, you know, time when a pregnant woman or a, a woman and a child might be released 99% of the time, the father will be caged, imprisoned, and deported. And now we see in San Diego, a community of Haitians, single mothers with children, whose partners, husbands, fathers have been ripped from them. So when we talk about family separation, we have to look at all of these as well. Go back to Haiti. Um, I know some people might not understand the history of Haiti in the West. I can go back briefly to give a 200 plus year history between the United States and Haiti. Um, we all know that the United States is the first country in the Americas as far as winning their freedom and what's not. But did we know that Haiti, right after the United States, became the first country, Black country, who fought one of the biggest armies of the time, the French army, and literally won independence. Wasn't given to them wasn't passed to them, they fought and they won. Do we understand that after Haiti fought and won their independence, the West, including the United States, agreed with France for Haiti to pay them their loss of revenue because they can no longer have slaves for them to beat and rape and just abuse. And do we know, for close to 50 years, the United States refused to recognize 
Haiti as a country, as an independent country, as a partner for fear that if the slaves in Americas really understand that they too can get their freedom, business will collapse. So therefore it was necessary for Haiti to become a poor country. And so I want people to understand the first thing we hear about Haiti is a whole poor country. How did one of the richest colonies of the time become one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere? The answer is simple. It was systematic violence that created the poverty that we see today. As my sister say, by design. And the fact that we see today, Haiti is in the middle of a political uprising. And people might see on the internet, hashtag free Haiti. What does that mean for us? It means free Haiti from internal violence and from external violence. The internal violence that we hear on the news, we see the pictures, yet we never see the reality on the ground. And the external violence that are indeed the cause of the internal violence. So as we talk about immigration, as we talk about anti-Blackness, as we now in the middle of, 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 of George Floyd's murder, and we see people are using as if George Floyd is the one on, in, in, on trial. And for me, when last year happened, for the first eight days, I couldn't bring myself to watch that video. Because the moment I heard it, I couldn't stop thinking it could have been me. And when we see what just happened in Atlanta, and we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters within the AAPI community, understanding that person, the murderer who killed all of these people had the time to not only attack one salon, one property, but three. Not only he had the time to do that, he had the time to flee and was caught hundreds of miles away. But when it was George Floyd, for a $20 that was presumed to be fake, George Floyd does not know how to make money. If in fact that $20 was a fake $20 bill, somebody gave it to him. How do we know he didn't get it from the gas station? How do we know that somebody just donated to him? Yet he was murdered within feet from that property. He was not allowed to step a couple of feet from where he was accused. And so after eight days and, and, and during that time we were in the midst of deportations, right? Um, I finally was able to watch that video. And it was really painful to see this officer with his knee on the man's neck for eight minutes. And I was transported to a hospital room in New York, watching Abner Luima on the bed after he was sodomized by so many police officers in New York City. I watched him as a young girl on that bed. Nobody knew he was going to make it. That was my first experience with police brutality. Then I remembered Amadou Diallo in the Bronx that was shot 15, 20 times holding his wallet. So when we see those things happening, when we see anti-Blackness, 
If you're a black person, it doesn't matter if you're Sadie from Senegal, if you're Mohammed from Somalia, if you're Gerlin from Haiti, or if you are an American descendant of slaves. If you are in this black body, that's all they see. That's all that matters. They don't care. So we look into how the system is created, continue the same cycle. And today, as I'm speaking to you, the same cycle of violence continues to cage Black immigrants, deport them, murder them, as the, as the, as the, as the plight of our brother from Cameroon, who died in Otay Mesa in San Diego. When he fell, nobody was able to help him and he died. So we look into all of those different things and we see, do black lives really matter? Black lives matter no matter where they are from. Is that true? As we see right now, the struggle that continues to be within our community, it is unacceptable. And we talk about immigration is a black issue. And I think I mentioned that before. Why do we have to be screaming immigration is a black issue in 2021 when we have the first black woman vice president whose father is Jamaican? Why do we have to bring the point that immigration is a black issue? When we had the first black man president whose father was, 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 was a, 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 an African immigrant, yet we have to still waving the flag that we exist. So we see every day, as Professor Abumaye mentioned, we have to continue to find ways to break that cycle. So we see the pipeline from school to prison, from prison to deportation. We see the over-policing of Black communities. You see that when a young boy gets stopped at the corner for having a, 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 a joint, they get arrested, they get criminalized, then they get deported. Yet today, marijuana is one of the biggest businesses and we know who's behind it, who's making the money. So it depends on who's the user, who's in charge, then it becomes okay. Then it becomes legal. So today again, we are here asking for so many different things and why and how do we as a people within ourselves, our families, our communities eradicate anti-blackness to make way for really having a, 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 a space, inclusive space for everyone. So we are tired of saying immigration is a black issue, but we will continue to say it until we all understand that until those black people are free, none of us can be free. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Gerlin, for an incredibly illuminating and incisive critique of the US imperialist carceral state, but also in terms of making sure that we push ourselves to have a better, deeper, and historical understanding of issues that may appear to be new within the last few years, whether it be around family separation, and particularly as how that is part of far longer histories of anti-Blackness. And again, 
challenging the stereotype of Haiti as a poor country. I really appreciated your talking about the impoverishment of Haiti. And at the same time, looking at in the same way as Mohammed did is how we can draw inspiration from the struggles of the people who are directly affected, their ongoing fight for liberation. So with that, again, thank you so much, Gavin, and I will turn it to Sadie Sar. Sadie is a lifelong social justice activist. Uh, and human rights activist. She's a curator of equitable practices through lived experiences. She's a founder and director of African Bureau of Immigration and Social Affairs. She is a Senegalese native, a graduate of Wayne State University of Social Work and Mary Grove School of Social Justice. Her passion for social equity drives from her commitment to advocacy at the intersections of racial immigration, socioeconomy, religious and gender issues. Again, there's much more to be said about Sadie, but she, through her, through her work, she shares and fosters her vision of a multicultural, multifaceted society built on acknowledgement, understanding, courage, transformation, and service. Salam, Sadie. Thank you so much for being here. Assalamu alaikum, Anne Marie. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for having me, and uh, um, thank you, Muhammad, mashallah, um, for setting the ground for this conversation and enlightening us on the idea of what Islamophobia look like. Um, and highlighting the conversation of being heavily policed, but being also heavily infiltrated. Because here, the Somali community, community here in Michigan, we have seen that the same exact stories with my family, my Somali family here, where their sons were being asked for information um, in the community in exchange of maybe helping him bring his spouse who was still stuck in the refugee camp. And um, I cannot thank Gerlin enough for um, highlighting what we know historically and um, putting a timeline on what she has been a witness at the border, you know, when she was the only one crossing and trying to feed thousands and thousands of families and there was nobody that was interested. There was no lawyers, there was no humanitarian help, there was no TV, there was nobody. As she said, those who was there and stuck there in 15 was black. And the other thing is that um, it is funny to me, the fact that everywhere on the continent that you can be, whether it is in Senegal, whether it is in Mali, whether it is in South Africa, in Ghana, there is not a space in the continent that you would go to visit and you would not meet a white man whether they are from France, from England, from USA. You see them across the world. They have the means economically to travel. They can get up and buy a ticket and go. Most of the time, if they are from the wealthiest country of the West, that's mean they barely don't have to pay a visa. So they don't have to go to no embassy. They don't have to say, hey, I need, a visa, they don't have to explain why do they have to travel or what they need to do is pick up their backpack and leave. However, when black people move, the movement of black people is seen, is categorized, is counted 
is limited, is hindered. So when you see black people moving across the globe, it's become an invasion. So movement in our ideology, we accept that free movement, traveling, being able to say, hey, I have curiosity, let me see, go see La Tour de Peas is only allowed if your color is not the skin of my, the skin I have. But if your skin look like mine, you have to explain, you have to prove, you have to be dehumanized in the process of saying, well, I am very curious, right? to see what the status of liberty look like, what Ellis Islands might have been. I have that curiosity. Just to be able to be like, oh my God, I wanna, you know, I wanna see this. And that have not started today. When my ancestors was chained and brought into this country, it had to serve a purpose. So when it is for the purpose of free labor, it is a purpose of dehumanizing and enslavement. Nobody asks any black person where they come from. Did they speak English? Could they read or write? That was nobody's interest. The interest was, can they make the journey? And would they be able to live long enough to produce for somebody else? There was no question about a visa being asked. Now, Dolin talked about the separation and the snatching of families. And I will go further because I think there is so many plaza in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Baton Rouge that have been the theater of family separation. So it is not yesterday, it is not in 2015, it started as soon as black bodies was brought here by force. So it is in our historical DNA in this country to rip a woman, to rip a child, from the breast of their mom. And there was no repercussion. So for us black immigrants today is to witness the cries, the pain of black families being ripped away and nobody having a ah moment. So when my families have tears, their tears don't have the same effect on us. It doesn't move us the same. It doesn't tell us that something is wrong and we should be angered. It doesn't tell us that we should stop and pay attention. Because we were programmed in this country to be numb to the pain of black people. Because in this country we have accepted that black people and black bodies could not have gained the empathy. We see it in our medical field today, when people have to be taught that they need to pay attention. When we talk about medical apartheid, when we talk about black women, black bodies not being treated the same, when people ask you what's your pain level and you say, well, it's a 10 and they still don't think you need to get the Motrin 600. Why? Because you're Black. Black women cannot be in pain. They can only be angry. Black men, no matter who they are, how many diplomas they have, how articulate the most insidious microaggression that people tell to Black intelligentsia, they can be, they can only be seen as a threat. And therefore, their body has to be policed 
or over police. And it took so many people. In the last 17 years I spent in this country, it took so many deaths of black men, black youth. They cannot play in a gazebo. They cannot walk in pairs. They can't just have a scuffle at the store. There's nothing that they can do. They can't leave. They can't breathe. It took so many deaths before we had the summer we had. The death of George Floyd moved something across so many people. It touched so many hearts. That in some spiritualities that we believe in, some of us are asking ourselves if the mission of George Floyd was to die inhumanely in the middle of a confinement for us to feel like, oh my God, what have we been witnessing? How can have we turn our eyes out and don't pay attention? So for me as a black immigrant, Muslim woman, walking here in the United States is requiring me every day to ask myself, what part of my identity today is going to be on trial? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm a black woman? Is it because I am an immigrant? Is it because I'm Muslim? So there is not a day that I have to catch peace because if one part of my identity is not an issue, the other one surely will. So I cannot escape the discrimination, the anti-blackness, the racism, the sexism, the Islamophobia, anything. Any ism that you have, I can't escape it. So when we sit and have to witness over and over again, simple acts of life being criminalized, Simple things such as driving a car. Here in Michigan, we are at the northern border and family separation is due to driving without a license, not for crossing the border. Family separation is due to running a red light. Family separation is due to driving five miles above the speed limit. Because in 2008, Legislation was passed to reduce the access to driver license to folks who overstay their welcome. The one that we call undocumented, without papers, in papeles, however you decide to name it. In a state and in a city where we have ensured by design that communities would not have access to public transport. Because for Ford to sell his car, we could not have public transport in Michigan. And today, so many years behind, public transport is still not a right in Michigan. So therefore we have to drive wherever we go. But if you don't have access to a driver license or if a driving violation is a removable offense, you can be removed from this country for a driving violation if you are an immigrant without status, then every day, nine to five conversation, going to the store, going to the pharmacy, taking your child to school, become a huge liability. And if you know Detroit, you know that it's a black city. If you also need Detroit, you know that it's still one of the most segregated city in America. If you know Detroit, you know that 41% of Detroiters live under the poverty line. 
So if you know Detroit, you know, therefore, that Black immigrants in Detroit are at a high risk of being arrested, being jailed, being separated from their family because of a driving violation. And we are okay with it. We're okay with it because somebody was not happy to have a bunch of immigrants in the state of Michigan that might be undocumented. And he didn't think that immigrant had the privilege to drive cars. And we, as Michiganders, voted for that. And there is a history in this country of policies that are specifically made to ensure that black bodies cannot benefit for simple act of daily living. We are just right now witnessing what is happening in Georgia, where it is now again illegal to give water and food to people who have to wait in line and vote. The same way it is illegal for some communities in the border to leave water for those migrants who might want to have a chance for a better future. But we find it okay for anybody else to say, oh, I have to move to San Francisco for a better life. I have to go to New York for a shot of my career. But we don't find it okay for a Senegalese, a Cameroonian, a Somalian to say, I'm gonna have to go to the USA for a better life. Why? Why do they have to cross the continent? Why do they have to come to the Americas? Why do they have to walk 11 countries by foot to come to this border in Tijuana? Because all the trade agreement that's make sure that we can have access to the cheapest things, cheap for our money, are being done at the expense of people that look like me, who are in the continent, who are the producer of cocoa or coffee, but then a young 21 year old from MIT get to set the price right here in Wall Street. He don't know what the story of the farmer in Cote d'Ivoire is, what that farmer had to do to farm that coffee, how much he had to put, how many years he worked, it doesn't matter to him. We can go to Starbucks and buy a coffee, our latte at what, $475? But at MIT, the young, my young MIT grad, get to sit in Wall Street and decide that the kilo of cafe have to be bought at 75 cents to the farmer who is all the way over there in Cote d'Ivoire and who worked so hard so many years to produce that coffee. He don't get to set the price of what he sell his coffee for. They don't get to set the price of what they're gonna sell their cocoa bean for. And there is nobody in America who would accept to work so hard to produce anything. And that somebody in Senegal decide for them what the price of that item is going to be. But we all enjoy those benefits. And as we continue enjoying those benefits, as we continue living up in this greed, we are driving movements of communities because there is a lot of folks who have been moving. The human flow from the continent to here is economically based. We create the system that are going to create spaces where folks can be chased out of their living quarters because of economy. We are economically displaced. And when now we aggregate, we, the United States of America, are aggregating all the wealth within the walls of the United States, we also get to tell people when they show up in our border for a chance for a better life, that they don't deserve that better life, especially when they are black or they have an accent 
And depending of the flavor of the day, like how Gerlin have said it earlier, every community gets its time on the salad. And last week, we had to witness our Asian brothers and sisters had to reckon with so much hate and so much pain. But then who are we to cry? When African Americans have been living in this state, in this country, and have been perpetually aggressed, violated, murdered, hanged, lynched, and that today they lived without sanctuary. Who are we to dare ask sanctuary? So when we show up at the shore of America and ask for sanctuary, there is no idea, there is no dream, there is no visualizing that folks that look like me should be given access to what sanctuary look like. So we all know it, racial colonial capitalist system, migrations, the way that we live in the world, we are all interconnected and that the flow of human being is gonna continue to happen and that we can't stop it. So the struggle for the liberation of black folks today in 2021 is not going to be achieved, is not going to be complete. Like my sister Gerlin said, if every single person who is black is not freed and liberated. So we have to ask ourselves, what would be our responsibility to ensure that black bodies where we are would be given the respect it is due, that their humanities will be not only seen, but respected and nurtured. And that we are also gonna continue to create systems that are not gonna do harm within our borders or beyond. Because if we let that harm continue beyond our borders by the means of economic slavery, by the means of neocolonization, then whatever work we're doing today, whether it is paying a bond, 35,000 bond, 50K bond, whether it is, you know, voting a certain way, whether it is making sure our communities are welcoming, that we have language access, right? It's not gonna work. If my people on the continent are continuously being economically displaced and are not being given the possibility to be free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadie, for your, once again, incredibly powerful words, profoundly important for us in moving forward as we seek to deepen and strengthen the struggle in defense, in support of Black immigrants, that we cannot do this without addressing the global historical perspective that you and your other fellow panelists help to raise for us. You, Sadie, you, you touch on so many themes and I am quite amazed on how you have been able to do that in such a short amount of time. And I, I thank you so much. I, I cannot, um, one of the 
key things that came out for, for me very quickly is how this very much, this whole panel, but Sadie in particular, picks up on a previous workshop we had with Professor Dennis Childs, when he's talking about the importance of recognizing how struggles for racial justice and immigrant justice are tightly intertwined and interwoven, and that we cannot see the struggle for immigrant justice without looking at the historical and ongoing criminalization of Black bodies, what he calls the slave ship as the prison ship, when we talk about the disproportionate deportation and detention of Black immigrants. We must put it in contact within the carceral system in the United States more generally. And it's in that sense that Free the Mall San Diego, while we have a very specific localized goal of shutting down the local detention center, our broader aim and is to, first of all, always situate our analysis, our struggle within an understanding that we cannot, we cannot fight for freedom and engage in struggle in a genuine, authentic manner without recognizing that we cannot achieve anything without at the same time abolishing the institutions of white supremacy upon which walls, borders, prisons, cages are built on. And remembering that United States as a white settler colonial state that goes beyond the borders of this country is itself a crime. So with that, again, I cannot thank all of our panelists enough for your words. I am somewhat lacking enough words to express my appreciation and gratitude. But with that, I will turn it to Fatima, who will lead us into breakout sessions. Yeah, also for me, thank you so much for your amazing presentations. And we've structured the breakout groups today a little different than usual. We will have three, each with one of our panelists, so that all participants will have the chance to engage further with the panelists and the breakout groups. And we have about 20, 25 minutes. So what will happen um, in a minute or so is that you all gradually will be put in those three groups. And I'm uh, posting some suggestions in the chat about how to um, to structure the breakout groups? Just you know, briefly say who you are, and we have a couple of questions that address our larger fo focus and also what the what the panelists brought up. What are the particular challenges if you're um, both a migrant and black, and what are the challenges for black migrant organizations? Um, that are not necessarily fa faced by other organizations and how can solidarity look like. So if you want to talk about that, or if you want to think of a specific action and support of our work and the work of our panelists, that is something that you can do, but please feel free to take the discussion um, wherever it leads you. And then it would be great if each group could decide on one, two people who would briefly report back after the breakout sessions, and then we'll have time for closing statements from all our panelists. All right, so now I'll open the rooms. Fatima, should we pause the recording?
Okay, I think everybody is back from the breakout rooms. Oh. And now we'll have time for a brief report back from the groups. If people can do that, and then for closing statements from our panelists. I just want to quickly point out that I'm about to post a report from Haitian Bridge Alliance called the Invisible Wall Report on on what is happening in terms of mass deportations of Haitians that's currently in the chat. Okay, so if we can take the next few minutes to hear from the various breakout rooms. Can I have one person from each breakout room? Would, and to make sure we're on track time-wise, would the panelists mind terribly if I would ask each of you to give a br brief summary of what happened in your breakout rooms? <laughs> Not to put any more pressure at all. <laughs> or if somebody from your you respective rooms volunteers. You owe me dinner, so I... <laughs> no problem. I, I can start. Um, thank you again uh, for having us. I, I was really blessed to be in a room with, with amazing uh, community leaders and, and fighters. We discussed how we can partner. We discussed, you know, struggle within San Diego itself, you know, my experience within the community. And then, um, you know, different people from Freedom of San Diego and detention resistance really uh, uh, shared, um, you know, answered the questions and, and really see how we'll continue to move forward. So it, it really was, was um, too short of a time. That's why I don't like breakouts because we don't have enough time to talk about everything. But we really, we really look into how we are moving forward. Thank you so much, Kelly. Oh my gosh, Soledad. Oh, I just see my sister there. Um, you know, be, before we, we continue, I just want, want yes. to, share, to share something. Yes, please. Um, uh, as I see Sol uh, uh, in here, um, she has been supporting, literally open, open up her home to receive people when they get released. So when somebody, when we bond somebody out, we go, we pay for the bond, um, CD and I, and I see Daniel in here who is leading our detention, uh, asylum seeker and bond, all of this, these things. And he is amazing. He's Cameroonian and he went through the journey. Now he is leading the work alongside myself and Sadie. And, and when people get released and we have nowhere to put them, Saul drives her car. She picks them up at the border when they get released. She takes them home. She feeds them and takes care of them. So I cannot thank you enough, my sister. And you are a, a true example what many hands lighten the load me. I am grateful for you. Well, thank you. And I actually miss doing it. I miss, I miss visiting. <laughs> yes. I so much. Yeah. So in the interest of time, so we want to really respect people's time, I'm going to then ask if while briefly reporting back on what happened to the breakout rooms, if at the same time the panelists can provide a closing statement. On, on how, how do we take what happened today, even though we only just scratched the surface, it was still an incredibly important intervention. Where do we go from here? Where would you like us to go? Is that question back to me again? I am, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, yes. Where do we go from here? It is where we have never been before. Um, it, it, it is how we collectively change the system. Um, I spoke about people at the US-Mexico border 
And my sister Sadie talked about people leaving home, understanding traveling in these black bodies to so many different countries. Currently, we have people that are stuck in Panama at that border. We have people stuck at the border in Peru, in Colombia, all over the world, right? We have people that are being making this journey because France and England and Italy and, and, um, and um, all of those countries who are the result of why those people are dealing with those things in the home country, countries are turning their backs against them. What do we in this space want to see happen tomorrow? What do we in this space willing to sacrifice to make sure that happens? Um, so, so for me, it's in the mindset of creating a better future, creating the stability, looking at what causes of why people are migrating, natural disasters, political turmoil, lack of opportunities, the same reason why we ourselves are here. Whether somebody came from the Mayflower, they were given a, you know, citizenship on the platter, or they arrived to a, 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 a Staten Island, or they are right now at the US-Mexico border knocking, asking for a chance. To me, it is all in the same. So how do we not go back to that mentality, but create a safe, place to welcome people with dignity, understanding that while people are traveling, there's so much trauma that needs to be addressed. You know, read the report, Title 42, that Haitian with Alliance just, just with it. So you, can, you have a better understanding of what Black migrants are, are dealing with. Read the report of Journey of Hope that, that Haitian Bridge Alliance released uh, uh, in January that specifically looked into Black women in Tapachula. These are the different things that we are looking into building together. How do we create a safe space? How do we create a, 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 a change, the mindset, understanding that mental slavery is what is guiding the world today. As long as we keep being enslaved mentally, no matter what our skin color is, we have to break the cycle. Enough is enough. Oh, one more thing, one more thing, TPS for Haiti. Um, uh, we have an action, uh, we are asking President Biden uh, to move past the anti-Black racism and give TP, redignation of TPS for Haiti. We are also calling on him to give TPS for Cameroon, Mauritania, the Bahamas, and other majority Black countries. So please go on your social media, hashtag TPS for Haiti now, uh, and, and let's push forward. Let's make the changes that we need to see. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Karine. Sadie, can I turn to you now? <laughs> Yes, definitely. So in our breakout room, we, we were blessed by Soledad. So we uh, explore the idea of um, what solidarity look like and uh, the different levels of it and complexity, right? Solidarity skin, solidarity status, solidarity. Are we gonna, you know, try to get the dreamers but let their parents, you know, not have paperwork? Are we gonna fight for families and children and leave single women and single fathers out? Are we just not gonna acknowledge that we do have LGBTQ trends, right? Are we gonna bring so those, how do we make sure that, you know, the, the voice at the fringes are being brought into the core of the conversation, right? And so that reminded us um, that, you know, since the 50s that she has been in this country, she has seen different communities at different time being at the center of the turmoil. And that if she came here in those time for an economical opportunities, people are still coming today for economical opportunities. And um, 
she also address um, the conversation of not seeing yourself in your own color. For example, she addressed the fact that, you know, there are some maybe, you know, African-American who don't see themselves in the immigration conversation for black immigrants. Um, she also mentioned um, some of the Mexican-American who might not see themselves in the issues of other, you know, Mexican on the other side of the border or other Latinidad folks. And um, for me, all of that is centered in the conversation of um, who is uh, uh, driving that narrative, right? She also, you know, talked about the very mere fact that there is a reality and a fear in whiteness being lost. And that when that is real, then it's almost like, you know, a, a, a seism, right? A seismic movement of um, a community that see itself not by their culture, by everything that they have to offer or where they come from, but see themselves in their power being linked to the color of their skin. And as you see other color numbers growing, right? Um, that fear of losing your foot, right? Losing it, losing the power because there is so many other people of colors, but you know, in my brain, I was just smiling because I'm sorry, you guys are, if you're white and you're afraid of that, uh, you're already a minority. You know, the global majority is not white. If you come out the walls of the United States, everybody else, you know, by side Europe is not, even in Europe, it's not like pure whiteness as we construed it. But for me, I just want to leave us with the idea that it is not pie, right? We have to stop thinking that it's an American pie and that if I have to slice it and slice it and slice it, there's so much you know, pie that can go around. So therefore I rather keep the bigger slice and give crumbs to the other. It is not pie. It's not because black people are going to be free that anybody else is gonna lose their freedom. It's not because women are gonna get you know, a certain pay <laughs> that some white men are gonna lose their pay, right? It is not because black students gonna have good education in Detroit that any other white student education in the Ivy League is gonna diminish. It is not pie, America. It is not a pie. And that where do we go from here is, you know, for me, can we just accept to not do harm? But in the idea of saying, I am not gonna do harm, have the courage to say, I am not gonna witness it being done. Because it's not about not doing it. To build peace, you really have to work for it. You don't need to go to war to build peace. But if people go to war and you say, I want peace, but you are not working for peace, there will be no peace. You don't have to engage to war to stop the war. You have to be engaged into really reforming or strengthening the peace that you want. So if we really want freedom all, we really need to be engaged into working for that and not be bystanders. We don't have the right to be bystanders. We never had the right to, but the comfort that we took in being bystanders, we really need to get off our asses and understand that that time is gone. And while we are doing that, please refrain from white explaining my pain. Refrain. Because if I am the one being poked, if I am the one being chained, if I am the one being sodomized, if I am the one having my child ripped up away from me, you cannot tell me how it feels. It's truly not. And because you cannot tell me how it feels, you cannot also tell me what would make it feel better. So in the spaces that we work, we need to you know, understand that in the concept, we still have to work together. Us black folks are not gonna make it without y'all black white folks and anybody else. But as we working, 
depending of who, you know, when we showed up in solidarity to stop Asian hate, we, you know, made our signs and let them tell us how they wanted to stop Asian hate to happen. We did not tell them this is how it's supposed to happen because we know how it feels. I don't know how it feels. I was not in Atlanta. I'm sure not a APAI. I do have the empathy. I can see the pain, but I cannot tell them how it feels. Definitely not. So, you know, I wanna say thank you for creating this space and for everybody else, right? I'm sure, you know, we, all, we already understand that black immigrant led organization are not funded properly that black immigrant led work is not centered. So whatever that can be done to amplify that conversation need to be done. Anybody who have any time to offer any space, any skills, any knowledge, somebody who know how to compute pay, you know, numbers and stuff like that, two hours a week, 10 hours a week, whatever it is, uplifting folks, anything, would help drive this conversation forward. Calling Fatima Al Tayyib, Soledad, whoever it is, Anne Marie, and saying, hey, what else can I do? I can push papers, then push papers. Right? If you want to commit to calling Biden every day, then call <laughs> Biden every day. Right? If you're going to say every day at 10 a.m., I'm making this call, they're going to hear this voice, then do that. Then do that. Don't say it's nothing, it's something. We just have to be consistent and stay the course. Because if we don't, are not consistent and you don't stay the course, we'll be here again. So thank you. Thank you for all my co-panelists. Thank you um, for the folks at the border. You know, thank you for everything that anybody is doing to uplift, to push, right? and to hold ourselves in this contemporary time accountable of what we are seeing, what we hearing and what we don't agree on, right? We don't have the right to be bystanders no more. Thank you. Thank you, Sadie. Mohammed, I will turn it to you. I hope all of you can stay with us a few more minutes. We're almost there. Thank you. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you. I'll 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 keep my uh, comments brief. Um, you know, really inspired by the comments and words of Sadie. Um, in my group, briefly, we talked about what solidarity looks like and what solidarity means. And I think that part of the conversation there was that, <clears throat> you know, that solidarity is, is is complicated work, and that you know, solidarity between these different groups is not possible without acknowledging the ways in which we oppress each other. I think one way we talked about that was, you know, looking at, you know, um, Arab anti-Blackness, particularly towards Black Muslims, right? Uh, and especially if you understand the long history in East Africa of the Arab slave trade. And, you know, while at the same time collectively coming together to fight Islamophobia, right? And so how do we, you know, build solidarity while also keeping each other accountable and not you know, sidestepping or ignoring the ways in which uh, we oppress each other, which I think is continuous and ongoing work and is work that's happening within the Somali community between, you know, Bantu Somalis who are oppressed by, uh, in San Diego by other Somali tribes, right? And this history of it. And, you know, my uh, comments that I wanna leave at is, you know, um, I think for me where I get inspiration is looking at Afrofuturism, right? That um, so often when we think about issues and black life and black, black struggle, or just, you know, oftentimes in the United States, people, we are present focused and present centered. And so that creates a historicalness and Afrofuturism is using black history as a way to imagine a different future, right? The history of slavery, the history of colonization, the history of the ancestors whose survival and love is what made us possible and how you know, we can create a world, right? A future without white supremacy, right? And, and that that future is being built by everyday folks in, in the black community. And really, again, um, if you echoing the words of, of Octavia Butler, 
uh, and the man, man, myriad of ways that Black people every day imagine a different future, right? Um, as, as you know, folks have said, you know, we are in many ways, you know, living the impossible dream of the slave, right? Um, what that looks like, right? Uh, and so I want to finish off with that and thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I'm going to turn it to Fatima. Yes, yeah, so thank you so, so much. That was really amazing. Um, both thanks to the panelists and all of you who attended and everybody from Free Them All who helped organize it. Um, hopefully we'll all see each other again um, next month on the last Wednesday. Please follow us on Instagram or email us if you wanna keep updated. And um, there are a couple of links in, um, in the chat, for example, of the Black Immigrants Bail Fund. So if you wanna support any of the people um, you encounter today, please do so. And um, yeah, I think this is it for now, um, but we'll see each other again in different places and in different connections. And yep, thank you. And goodbye until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you again so much to all of you for being here and the panelists. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Ma salama. Sadie, call me. See, I'm going to put your business in the streets right here in the in front of everybody. Um, call me, girl. I'm gonna call you right away. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Marie, we'll talk at 1 a.m., okay? Sure, sure thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And then he's like, call me too. <laughs> <laughs> I stop hunting me. I stop running for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have to laugh to survive. Um, thank you, everyone. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. So if I stop the recording, who is it going to get sent to? to Jess? I think it's gonna it's gonna be sent to me anyway because I'm host. I can also just stop it. <laughs>